Mayor Don McCormick, oddly enough, I was reading about a mystic not long ago, and the mystic who has been practicing his mysticism in one particular area, that uh, he says applies to everybody, of course. He said in the morning he gets up really early and he spends the first 30 minutes getting to yes. And I thought, well, he said, I know it'll sound woo-woo, but I wake up and I think all the things I don't want to do, no, I have to get away from all those things. That, no, 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 I don't want to do that. I, I need to get to yes and open myself up to <laughs> yes and, not no, but. I sort of have the feeling that Kimberly has had in the 10 years we've been here, a kind of getting to yes attitude, perspective. And as you think about the state of our city, do, have, we, have we gotten to at least more yes? Or a good solid maybe. <laughs> yeah, so, so that's a, a really good question, Paula. Um, and I guess, um, uh, I guess it's, it's been, this is my, um, ninth year, I guess, that I've been on council and, uh, my answer nine years ago would have been a little bit different than what I'm <laughs> going to answer today. Um, I think, uh, human nature is such that, um, we only change when we are required to change. It's not something we like to do. Or oh, let's change. <laughs> And uh, uh, five or six years ago, seven years ago, um, the city was in a, a real state of transition. In fact, it was probably transitioning late, given that the mine closed in 20, 2001. And so, we're now in 2020. And we're now in 2020. And in 2012, 13, uh, you know, kind of 10 years after, I think the, the community as a whole came to the realization that um, if we didn't make some changes, um, you know, we were going in the wrong direction. And so um, at the time um, I was first elected mayor, there was a real uh, mood for change. Um, people knew that such change of some kind needed to happen. Uh, I ran on a, uh, on a uh, platform of change and uh, managed to be successful at that time. So over and that time- And then again, it's worth saying- Yeah, the, and, and the job wasn't quite done in four years. Uh, so, um, you know, there was, uh, we need to finish the job that we started was basically the message I was giving, giving back in 2018. And I think what I've observed is that we've come a long way, first of all, in the last five or six years, we've come a very long way uh, by almost any metric that you wish to use. What's interesting is that, um, you know, first of all, we're not where we need to be. It's better. And I think as residents uh, and taxpayers, we need to realize that uh, it is only just better. And that given that we rely on uh, tourism uh, for most of our economic activity uh, and tourism being as fickle as it is, uh, we can't rest. And we need to do the things and make the changes we need to make in order to get to the next level. And then there will be another and another after that before we can feel like we're insulated from all the bad things that we could slip back into. And, and one of those things you <clears throat> uh, off, off camera, you had said that there is still concern about asset sales, and that's part of this picture of which you speak, isn't it? Uh, well, it's part of uh, what would be considered a real change, mm -hmm. right? It's all part of the change thing. What I've observed is that as things have gotten better, there is a resistance to change happening. And uh, the asset sale would be a really good example of that, where there is... Um, and the assets are? When it was first announced that we were selling bootleg golf uh, and uh, the Riverside Campground, uh, there were a portion of the population that understood what we were doing uh, and the rationale for it. But there was a very large portion that uh, didn't like it at all. Um, well, are it was... they still going to pay taxes? Or will they now pay taxes? Absolutely. Um, there's a lot of very good reasons why we're doing this, but uh, without understanding what those reasons were, there were lots of people that said, you should never be selling these kinds of assets. Uh, they're making money, so why would you sell them? And, uh, you know, the really simple answer to that is twofold. Number one, we need the money. Uh, and uh, aside from going back to taxpayers and asking for more money, this is a source of new revenue that will allow us to keep our tax rates uh, manageable for lots of people in town. Uh, and the second, uh, the second reason, uh, A, we need the money. And uh, the second reason is because they're making money. Uh, assets are at their maximum value when they're in fact profitable. And, and can uh, they change use? I mean, once somebody buys it, can they turn it into a, uh, 
uh, a mega mall? Well, this this was this is the concern you know that most people have, and I find it kind of interesting because you know council and you know senior management at the city of Kimberley are tasked with managing our assets and managing them in a way that's in the best interest of the taxpayer. And yet when a change like this happens, it's the worst possible thing. We are going out and we're going to destroy the assets that we have. It's, it's, I find it counterintuitive, but I guess it's, you know, in the absence of answers to all of the questions, you know, people fear uncertainty and doubt reigns, uh, not dissimilar to the coronavirus uh, that we're going through right now. Uh, the fact is that, um, you know, so far this flu season, more than 12,000 people have died from the common flu. And when you compare that to what's happening with the coronavirus, it's, you know, you have to ask yourself, what are we concerned about? Well, what we're concerned about is the unknown. It's what could happen given that we don't have all of the detail. So specifically with those two big pieces of land. So we will end up generating in the neighborhood of five or six million dollars in cash for the city of Kimberley. We will get... Um, uh, taxes back from those organizations and in the case of the golf course the taxes are going to be what the lease payment the city was getting in the case of the campground when you combine taxes along with the um, with the utilities uh, payments that we're going to be getting and some other considerations um, we are at a minimum at a break even on a cash flow basis and have five or six million dollars in the bank to be able to top up our reserve funds uh, which are critically important from an infrastructure uh, renewal point of view, uh, and give us, even after the, the reserves are topped up, it will give us uh, additional money in the Kimberley Reserve Fund to be able to take advantage of opportunities when they come up, uh, particularly from a granting point of view. And back to that mega mall. What she's asking is the land use. How yeah. radically can we change the oh. Is somebody going to change the land I use? I wasn't ignoring uh, <laughs> that question, Paula. Uh, the, the answer is that in the course of setting up the RFP, the city has put together conditions under which the sale is happening that will preclude that uh, from happening. And in the case of the golf course, the biggest concern people have is that uh, some real estate developer is going to come in and buy it and going to build big homes and, and eventually the golf course will be gone. Well, the fact is that um, that entire property has a restricted certificate of compliance on it uh, that precludes any real estate development from happening there ever. So, is that a local thing? No, it's the Ministry of Environment. Uh, oh. You know, based on the uh, based on the previous usage of that land and its degree of contamination, um, that's it's it's being used as a golf course, and At it will be that way. At provincial level, you just don't get to mess with. Well, it would be it would be virtually impossible. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's taken us twelve or fourteen years now to try and get a you know fourteen acres up on the Marysville bench, uh, you know, certified. Believe me, um, you know the golf course. I mean, this is just not a consideration. It's also worth saying um, this is a very tourism dependent economy. Those both are tourist related. Oh, huge. And there's no guarantee, given that a lot of that is weather dependent and the weather is changing, that tourism mm -hmm. is going to be, I mean, if I, if I own that property, I would think seriously about selling it to someone who has more faith in the in the future of tourism than, uh, than otherwise. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, if you take those resources and spread them out so that we develop uh, the economy in a broad sense of, of our community, that makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and with some explication, it can make sense to a lot of people who are still a little concerned. Yeah, fair enough. And uh, I think what I've learned through this whole process is that, um, and, and as it was with um, uh, with the um, uh, other assets, you know, that are sold, there are certain people that until it's a done deal and there's a year or two, you know, past the closing of the deal, when they see that, you know, disaster, in fact, is not going to happen. Uh, that's the only time they're going to be satisfied. So I think uh, <laughs> I think what we need, both from a council and from a uh, senior management point of view, is a good plan, uh, an understanding of what we're doing and why we're doing it. Uh, we take a look at the risks associated with it, and we get on with getting it done. We get to yes, uh, there in you fact, go. <laughs> very quickly. Part of what you're, I mean, you're talking about change, and it could sound, as you, as you talked about it, that we had to make a change, then we're going to sit for a while. And my impression is what you, your, you and your colleagues are trying to do, and I think the community, mostly, is trying to 
uh, forgive me, institutionalized change, mm -hmm. that instead mm -hmm. of lurching from crisis to crisis, you know, mm -hmm. looking up and saying, you know, where did that come from? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's part of the process that, that you and, and the council over the last, well, into the second term, your mm -hmm. second term, mm -hmm. Uh, have tried to do, which is to set up the, the mechanisms, the tools, uh, the procedures, the processes, processes uh, <laughs> for uh, for institutionalizing an aware, you know, a an early warning system. Mm -hmm. Looking forward enough and having having the tools uh, to address what looks like is going to happen, you know, ten years from now, fifteen and, years from right. now, and then be able right. to adapt if it if and when it doesn't. And that <clears> might get us to the state of the city, which does. Both the looking backward and looking forward is—is is that right? Uh, it is uh, not so much looking backward as much as um, recognizing the trends uh, that are happening with the various metrics that we're using to determine whether we're moving forward or, you know, backwards. And um, this year in particular, um, I guess this is the fourth year that I've been doing the state of the city now, and each year our ability to produce the metrics and to show trends uh, is getting better and better. So uh, I think um, that took a lot of work too. I think people will be quite um, um, uh, riveted, uh, if I can use that strong a word, uh, to some of the data points uh, as they come. And from my point of view, uh, the way we use those um, at the city is to take a look at the trends and try and be in front of the next incremental change that needs to happen to ensure that we're trending in the right direction. And um, I think getting back to your comment about institutionalizing change, Bill, um, I guess a lot of people look at change as an event. It's this thing is happening that's different from before, when in fact what we're doing is we're evolving our, ourselves forward, and it's a sequence of changes that when you put it all together, you see this trend that says, wow, we're going in the right direction. And a wise old, very, very old, he was 97 at the time, man, person, said to me, Paula, Remember, change is the only constant. <laughs> it's so true. So you want to talk about particulars? <laughs> uh, particular changes? No, particulars <laughs> in how you're thinking about the well, state of the city. You and, your... you and the council have figured out how to structure. You're asking right, substantive right, questions no, on the enough. front end and then trying to collect the information yeah. necessary yeah. to respond to what <clears throat> seems to be the important issues in the community and doing that in a finite with a finite number of issues. Right. Well, if, if we go back to uh, 2014, uh, right following that election, uh, the um, uh, what we did as a council is sat down. Um, Scott Somerville, our chief admin officer, uh, facilitated a, a session around establishing what we called at the time strategic priorities. They were basically this, this one or two or three things that staff could use in order to frame decisions that are being made. In other words, we have a limited amount of money just resources, not just money, but resources. And uh, how do we make sure that we are spending those resources in a way that maximizes the value back to the taxpayers? So we came up with a list of five. And in 2018, following the last election, we sat down again, a similar session. And we took a look at those five, took a look at the progress we've made and said, okay, what changes do we wish to make? So we ended up with um, basically carrying three of those priorities over. Um, Two of them weren't established as priorities, but they were still a big deal. One was customer service, which is always a big deal, but we felt that we had made enough movement on that that we didn't have to isolate that as a specific priority. And the same thing with communication. Uh, we, we moved a light year in four years with respect to how we're communicating uh, to the community as a whole, to our taxpayers. Um, it, it, we, we just made a lot of improvements. On both of those, we continue to improve. Incremental improvement is kind of the order of the day. But we felt that from a strategic point of view, there were a couple of other things that um, deserve to be on the list for this term uh, more than those two. Uh, one of them was the, um, was the focus on core services. In other words, we all have talked about infrastructure renewal. You know, we get that sewer and water and roads, uh, garbage, these kinds of things are, are our core services. And we felt that um, it was important to identify those core services and make sure that the money we had available was going in and moving those along this infrastructure renewal line uh, at a pace um, that made sense. So we identified core services as a strategic priority. And uh, 
the other, uh, the second one was uh, reducing our environmental impact as as a city, as a municipality, and also as a community. And so, <clears throat> pardon me, with uh, those two additions, uh, the three remaining had to do with uh, financial accountability with respect to taxes and and uh, you know how we uh, uh, how we respect uh, taxpayer money, uh, infrastructure renewal, as I've already mentioned, and. Um, the, uh, the third was facilitating a diverse economy. We called it economic development the first time around, but economic development has, has proven to be a very nebulous term. And it's almost the eye of the beholder when it comes to defining what that means. So um, uh, facilitating a, a diverse economy uh, more than just tourism is how we framed it uh, this time around. So uh, on Wednesday night at the, uh, at the State of the City, um, the metrics, you know, where we've been, where we're going, the trends uh, and the priorities are all framed around these five strategic priorities. Everything is, is in one of those buckets. So that um, uh, I think it will make lots of sense, uh, you know, to people uh, as they're listening. Since you're interested in communication, will that be available in hard or soft copy going forward? <laughs> well, my presentation will be available. Um, yeah, it's a good question, uh, Paula. Um, I think I think there's an opportunity to uh, look at how we communicate this in a, in a much broader sense, uh, which we're still talking about. So we may see, you know, some additions to that between now and uh, Wednesday. We don't want to make it so good on the broad context that nobody shows up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think that that's a problem. <laughs> Otherwise, it becomes a uh, webinar, for goodness sake. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing wrong with webinars. <laughs> so, uh, but we do want to get this out, uh, you know, as broadly as we can. And in fact, what it what it will be is kind of a um, not a dry run, but a um, uh, a proxy for the annual report, mm -hmm. uh, which comes out in May. And uh, Scott and I have talked about how we'd really like to be doing the State of the City update at the same time as the annual report is is uh, uh, is uh, 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 published. So um, you know, we'll I, I think if we did that, we'd have a lot more people reading the annual report, <laughs> uh, which is, would be the answer to your question. <laughs> But uh, but we'll see how that evolves. Well, that actually is the answer. I mean, it, that is available. The annual report is available yeah. on your website. If you really want to know, uh, rather than calling up and yelling at you, no, start, start with the uh, <laughs> annual report. So the most important, uh, if history is any, any gauge, the most important part of this whole thing Wednesday night is going to be the question and answer mm -hmm. at the end. Mm -hmm. I mean, I will present you know, a formal, probably for about 45 minutes, a formal presentation that talks about all these things. Uh, but then I'm going to throw it open for uh, just questions and answers. And in previous years, uh, we've had uh, the better part of an hour, um, you know, of Q&A. And in fact, I think in every year we've had to cut off the questions because it's just gotten late and uh, <laughs> we've had to leave the facility. So I expect that again. The last time we talked, uh, <clears throat> the city was on a run with uh, new development coming in and the expenditures on construction. Right through three quor three quarters of the four quarter year uh now that we've passed the final quarter how did we yeah. end up in uh, 19. well we finished the year off in pretty much spectacular fashion uh the uh, the total value of building permits for 2019 was 32 million dollars wow. uh, to put that in perspective it was 15 million the previous year 15 million the previous year to that and then it dropped all the way off down to five or six million going back into, uh, you know, 2013. But uh, those are all considered. Those are all within frameworks. It isn't just wild, uh, uh, old west, if you will, uh, speculative development. Not this at is... all. In fact, none of it is speculative. Um, I, I, you know, the, the vast majority is residential uh, construction, whether it be renovations uh, to existing homes, which continues to be very strong. Uh, or new dwelling uh, development, which, which would need. be single-family homes, uh, multi-unit residential, mm -hmm. uh, carriage homes, you know, uh, suites, that kind of thing. And uh, we, we generated, and this was kind of a big deal, because we generated um, 83 or 84 new dwellings last year. Uh, the previous year was 42, I believe, and uh, that was the biggest ever since like 2007. I want to, just a bit of a context. I am so excited that after my whole lifetime, I can now recycle virtually everything. Yeah. Uh, and that's, uh, I say this, my garbage once a week is this big. 
literally. Yeah. But I say all of this in the context of you, you didn't do that alone. You, and Kimberly doesn't do anything alone. We're in the context of the RDEC, of yeah. the province, and this interrelationship. It's not like we're just this little little town that's getting bigger and better and all of that. Mm. It, it's, it all has to fit together, doesn't it? It does. Uh, the one thing I will say about uh, Kimberly um, is that um, uh, we, we try to be on the forefront of, of a lot of this change. Now, um, the theory is, and we're not doing that just for posterity, uh, the theory, uh, not even the theory, the practicality of it is that as we move into these things, money in the form of either grants or money available to make these things happen uh, comes to those that are quickest out of the gate. And in fact, not just money, but resources to help make these things happen. And so over the past five years, with a lot of things that we've been involved in, we've, we've tried to be aggressive if we decide we're going to do it, we try and be very aggressive and be first in. And in doing that, we get all kinds of resources to make the, it happen. This is a positive feedback loop. If you can, I mean, if you can figure it out, uh, everything you do generates more and more and more, which is, you know, redefining in a way that's a good reason to redefine economic development as a, a much broader mm -hmm. uh, process. Yeah, absolutely. We also have an extraordinary force with the Columbia Basin Trust. Mm -hmm. And I, mm -hmm. I never really forget to say <clears throat> one, two, three, and the Columbia Basin Trust, which has had such a profound impact across mm. the Columbia Basin on both sides of the, of the uh, 49th parallel. Mm -hmm. Well, it, well it, they don't fund on the other side, but the basin is on yeah, the other no, side and, too. And it continues to. Um, there, there are, if you translate, I mean, the money is one thing. There's about $63 million a year that, uh, that CBT has been putting into the basin communities. And that's 40 some communities within the basin, 175,000 people. Uh, so that is a massive impact on a population that is, um, it's that small. I mean, 175,000 is a pretty small population to say we're just going to drop $63 million in. And we're required <clears> to. And, and it's uh, not just about the money. It's, it's about how that money is, is framed. And there are more than 70 different programs across the entire basin that that money is, is, um, uh, is uh, uh, supporting. So uh, it's really, really high impact. Uh, no question about it. I want to go back to the, the housing piece for a moment. That housing is a problem all over the, at least the developed world, and probably all over the world for different reasons. Uh, it's a major issue in Canada. It's a major issue in the U.S. It's a major issue in Europe. Um, affordability and just the the accessibility more more broadly. Mm -hmm. are, are we now ahead of the curve on that? Are we yeah. catching up? I wish. Are we? No, we're we're not. We're we're treading water. I guess would be the best way to describe it. Uh, 80 new dwellings at an average of 2.1 people per dwelling. I mean, we're looking at about, say, 170 people we now have additional housing for. Uh, that happens to be what our population rate is growing at, about 150 to 200 people a year. So all we're doing is holding holding steady. Uh, so in, in my opinion, we still have a fairly significant supply issue. Uh, we need to get supply uh, to the point where we have vacancy and we have a healthy uh, list of homes for sale and, and rental vacancies. But at what point do you say enough? Do you, uh, do you really want enough housing so that you can have 45,000 people live here? Um, I don't, I don't think it works that way, Paula. Mm -hmm. Um, if I, I think, I think what, what's happening is that, um, I mean, we talk about Kimberly, you know, to be a, uh, a really good place to be. Um, you know, we understate kind of what we're doing. And I think that kind of understatement and kind of the vibe that we've got going on around town is attracting people. People want to live in Kimberley. And we as a municipality uh, or as a community don't get to dictate uh, how many or who comes in. Uh, we, uh, uh, we will reach a point, I think, where the, uh, where the population will reach a certain stage where things begin to change. They could change in a very positive way and continue, that momentum could continue, or they could change in a way that people say, you know, that's it. There's other places where uh, I like the vibe better and I'm going to move there. There's this kind of equilibrium that, that you end up getting. Right now, we are a place where people want to live, and it behooves us as a municipality to try and create the kind of environment uh, that will encourage builders and developers to bring supply in. It's a very symbiotic kind of thing. 
And I think if we mess around or try and limit that kind of thing in any way, shape, or form, we risk destroying the vibe. And so um, um, I, we're a facilitator, and as long as people want to live here, then, you know, Symbiotic. we're, we're going to try and make that happen. Symbiotic sounds a lot like life. <laughs> yeah, indeed. You spend probably more time out talking to a broad range of people than anybody in the community. I can't think of anybody that, you know, isn't mm-hmm. specialized in talking just to a target group that's out more. Uh, you've been doing that for several years. Um, have you seen, you talk about the vibe, but have you seen a, a, a movement, a change in how people feel about the community, how people feel about the environment, how people feel about one another? It, how has it changed or has it changed? Um, so that that's probably a uh, probably a difficult question. I to thought be, it might be. <laughs> for a precise answer. Um, I think that uh, any community, the lifeblood of every community is... Um, is young families, mm. right? It's young mm. families coming, uh, you know, lots of kids, the schools are full. That creates a certain dynamic in town uh, that I think every vibrant community needs to have. We have that. Um, if you look at where, um, you know, the fastest growing portion of our community, if just by uh, Canada's uh, census data alone, uh, it's, it's, in the younger, it's in the younger demographic. Um, we continue to grow on the senior side of things as the boomer population continues to age and we attract boomers with our outdoor recreation lifestyle. Uh, we will continue to grow there, but we are really growing at the, um, at the, um, the young end of the scale. Uh, our schools are full, uh, which creates a, a really interesting issue for School District 6. Um, uh, so I, that, that is definitely a change. Uh, 10, 15 years ago, we were closing schools and uh, now we're bursting at the seams and saying, where are we going to go with this? So, so that's one visible, you know, visible change. The other one has to do, um, just about the, uh, the change in the, um, in the workforce, you know, the, the profile, uh, of the workforce. And, uh, right now with all of the construction that we've got going on, I don't know that there's ever been a better time for trades. Um, mm. and we've got lots of grads uh, coming out of uh, College of the Rockies um, and uh, we've we've got you know pretty much if somebody wants to be employed um, you can be employed uh, the way uh, you know the way the uh, the activity is going on right now uh, that hasn't always been the case um, you know in the uh, 15 years ago we had a population that needed to work uh, the Elk Valley or you know, in northern Saskatchewan or northern Alberta. We were still a mining economy. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. So, uh, so that's changed. We've also seen a change in the, um, in the retail, um, I'll use the re- term retail demographic or the description of what we have as retail establishments. Uh, we no longer have, uh, you know, similar stores to Cranbrook. I think we've got a lot more unique boutique opportunities that are attracting people from Cranbrook to come here to shop, as opposed to us wanting to stop people from going to Cranbrook, which is what it was like 15 years ago. Uh, That's been a big change. Um, That transition in our retail environment, um, I mean, retail is ever transitioning. Um, I mean, in any given community, there's probably a 20% turnover a year. Uh, We don't, ours isn't that high. We've got relatively low, but by the same token, we are... um, we are still ever changing. Um, the, um, the city, uh, the city of Kimberley, uh, commissioned a um, uh, a report here a year ago. Uh, it was basically a gap analysis, a retail gap analysis, to try and understand where are people spending their money, how are they spending it, and what do we need here in order for them to spend more money here. Uh, that is going to be published in the next little while, and I haven't seen it, but uh, hopefully we'll learn something from that and help again facilitate um, you know the the evolution of our our retail environment as well so there's just some examples and i could probably cite a few others that uh, you know these are all really positive changes that have led to this dynamic of people wanting to live in kimberley and we do (laughs) yeah do we ever it's an awesome community thank you for leading it and we will look forward to how we can participate in that process my pleasure paula thank you uh, for having me (laughs) 